Conference, your source for JVM knowledge. Hello. Okay. Okay, let's get started. Um, this talk is called Android Develop um, Android Developed Tools and Workflows. And my name is Saul Molinero. I've been working as an Android developer now, I guess, for five or six years. I work in a company called Popsy, which, is, which allows people to send secondhand stuff, similar to Wallapop, Let Go, and that kind of markets. But the difference is that we are not running too much in Spain. We are mostly on Brazil. We have around 1.3 million users on Android and 300,000 on iOS at, the, at this moment because we released it this year. And I'm coming from Vigo, from Galicia, which is, if you are not on, from Spain, in the north east west of, of Spain, and it's such a beautiful place. So if, if you have the opportunity to visit it, please, if you can let me know, I will suggest you some very nice places to eat because we have very nice food, and to visit as well. And there, I'm also, I'm also co organizer of two developer groups for the Google Developer Group of Vigo, which I'm not really active lately. And I'm more active with the Android Developer Group in Vigo. Uh, there is another Android Developer Group here in Madrid, um, led by Nicolás, which is doing a very nice job uh, regarding the community. And there are more groups like this on Valencia, I think, and Barcelona, and I'm not sure if there are more. Uh, the nice thing that we have uh, in Vigo, and I promise that I will go to the content after these slides, is that we, I'm, uh, I, I'm very proud of what we have there because uh, we have several groups of different technologies, and we are all grouped into something that we call Vigo Tech Alliance, and there we serve resources, we, we serve places to give talks, we have a Slack community, and an aggregator for events, and it's really good. So I encourage you that if in your city you have different groups, try to put them all together, and nice things are going to happen. And now, let's go to the content. The dog that is there is my dog, and I'm really proud of her. <laughs> so uh, you will see it uh, across the slides, because in fact, I'm from Vigo, and he's, and he's in, in Madrid as well. Uh, okay, uh, this talk is divided into different subcategories. The first one is runtime tools. And I call a runtime tool something that I use when I have my, my Android device plugged to the computer, okay, or my emulator turn, uh, running. The one tool that I'm going to share is one that you are probably used to because mm, during this talk, I'm going to share tools and parts of the Android Studio uh, environment that you, are prob that you probably already know, but I want to recall the importance that some uh, tools inside the, the environment has, and some other tools that you are probably familiar with that I use it a lot during, during my work, my daily work as an Android developer. The first one is PitCat. PitCat is just a wrapper for the LotCat, for the common LotCat that you can check on Android Studio as well. And the thing that I like from it is that it formats the output in a pleasant way for read. And I'm very used to find patterns when the application crashes. And you can filter by tag, you can filter by package, and you can do more things. You can install it via Homebrew, Homebrew if you are using Mac. It's on, on GitHub as well. It's made by Jake Wharton. He's a guy that no one knows, knows him. And it's very, it's very popular into the Android community. And it has some command line arguments that you can you can put. They are all in the in the repository. Another tool that I use on a daily basis, and I love this one a lot. That that one is is Popsy, is the application that of of our company where we work. And I'm going to call it SourcePy because I'm pretty bad spelling letters because as, as you can see my English is not really good. And you probably don't want to hear me all the time saying S is RPI. So I will call it SourcePy. And SourcePy allows you to screencast your device, the, the device that you have turned as a physical device to the computer. And the killer feature is that allows you to send input events as well to the device. 
And this is very good because you don't have to lift your hands from the, from the computer, which is, for me, very good. You don't need to have the device looking at you. You can put it with the screen on the table in case you are in a cafe and you don't want to, to, to show the, the, the screen of your application. And the point here is that the, la the latency that has, at least on my computer, which is a good one, is very, very low. So it, wor it works very smoothly, as you can see. And previously, I've been using Visor, which was another tool. But I think that the latency there was higher. So uh, but, uh, SourcePy, for me, is really good. It has some nice features as well that, to be honest, I discovered when preparing this talk after using the tool for years. And one is that you actually can drag and drop an APK, an APK and it will be installed into the device. You can even drag files and magically it will be moved to the SD card folder into the device, which it, it can be good. And you can record video as well, as so other many tools that are for recording videos of, uh, from ADB. Another tool that is pretty old as well, because maybe it has, I don't know, three years, two, two years, is Esteto. And Esteto allows you to verify the state of your application in your running device in different ways. One way is that allows you to check the network, thanks to the Chrome Developer Tools, OK? Because it, use, it uses the, the Chrome Developer Tools under the hood. And you can inspect the network that your application is doing within the network panel of the, of the Chrome Developer Tool, which is really good, if you know it. And you have also a, pref a preference inspector that you can write on them on runtime, which is pretty interesting as well. And you can read, of course, the values of, of the preferences. And there is also a view hierarchy that allows you from the elements panel, the first tab, to check the XML of your layout uh, there. For me, it's a bit pointless because my, I, I use another tool for that, but it's there and it's good to know it. And the killer feature that has, that has a state of for me is the database inspector. The database inspector allows you on runtime to check the state of your different databases that you have in the application. For example, we are having two in the, in the in our application, which is the first one and the Popsy room. There are more, but the ones that we access are those two. And the one is the legacy one, the legacy database that has been all has been from the first release on the application. And we are now moving everything to room and we have some tables there. And another killer feature that the Steto has is that allows you to query the database on runtime. This is that if you click where it says Popsy Room DB, it will show you a command line and you can write there, select name from user where username is whatever. And the result is gonna be formatted into a table and is really good because uh, again, this is on runtime. But it's a tool that is a bit old and actually there is another tool that is called Flipper is not Jorge, it's also a tool. And Flipper is the replacement of Esteto, or at, appears to be the replacement from Esteto because it's done by the, the same authors of Esteto, which, which is Facebook, okay? These two libraries, or these two tools, are compared, are made by Facebook. And the features that, that Flipper has is that it's a standalone app, this means that you don't need the Chrome Developer Tools anymore. It's iOS compatible, okay, it's iOS compatible. It's easy to extend. This means that you can write your own plugins and it will be shown there and you can access to whatever you want to show about your domain or the domain of your application. And it provides a leak canary plugin. If you don't know, leak canary is a library that allows you to detect and analyze memory leaks from your application. So this tool, if you add this plugin, it will show a new, a new tab on the left that if you press it, it, you will show if the leak canary detected something like a memory leak, it will be up, appeared there. And it has also a crash reporter. A crash reporter is just that if your application fails, if your application crashes, first, a system notification will be shown, which can be good. 
and then the, a detailed report it will be shown there. This is the stack trace, the color methods, and I think and more things they include on the, on the cross report. And there is also a CPU profiler that allows you to analyze the CPU of your application and the allocat viewer as well. The bad thing that Flipper has, at least for me, is that doesn't include a viewer for your database. So I said that for me, Esteto, the killer feature that has is the database inspector. So Flipper is not my tool. And it's true as well that Flipper is on a version 0 0.3. whatever, and this means that maybe the development is not finished there yet, and this tool for inspecting the database, it will be included. We don't know. The, it's maintained by Facebook. It's pretty active. They have a lot of activity on the repository, and I recommend you to check it out. The next tool that I like to recall, because you probably know it, is are the profilers that are inside Android Studio. The, in particular, I'm going to talk about the CPU profiler right now, and that allows you to do the profiler is to check how your CPU is behaving, and from a range of, because it shows you a graph, that in the x-axis, it represents the time, and the i, I think that is the, the time that your code is taking for computing. Okay, and this is that you can select a range having your application running. For example, let's say that you are scrolling on a recycler view because we are Android developers, or at least I'm Android developer and I'm using the profiler for, for debugging my Android app. And I start scrolling on the recycler view and I feel it a bit laggy. I feel that something is not going well. So I can plug, it, plug this tool, I can select a range in the meantime that I'm scrolling, and then when I click on stop, it will represent a, a chart or a call chart that are the, the times that are taking my, met my methods for running. And that means that if, if something on my site is too high, that means that I'm computing too much on the UI thread and I, I will probably be losing frames. And if you are doing wrong here, you won't fit the, the 60 frame per second goal, and that will mean that your application is not being performant. You will lose frames, and your application will appear laggy on, on UI. So this is a very nice tool that allows you to, to find out that kind of issues. Then there is also a network profiler on Android Studio, and I really like to use this one. You even you can, or you might use another tools as the Charles proxy or different proxy tools that are for analyzing the request that allows you even to modify in the middle. But I'm really used to to use the network the network profiler because for me it's really easy to use and and I don't have to configure anything. And in the same way that you use the CPU profiler, you use the network one. And it represents on the graph the, the, the network that your application is doing, and you can select a, a range of time, and it will list the requests that have been sent and received, the amount of data that you've sent and received, and you can inspect each request, checking the status code, the, the request that you sent to the server in, in a JSON manner, the response from the server, the headers, so it's pretty, pretty interesting. And I recommend it to check it and start using it if you, if, you, if you don't. And the last profiler that I'm including in, in the presentation is the memory profiler, because I really believe that it's a, a huge one that allows you to visually analyze how your memory or the memory of of the device is behaving with your application. And this means that while you traverse the app, you are seeing that the graph is increasing too much, that probably means that your application is not freeing memory because you have memory leaks in there. And you can notice as easy as checking the graph and interacting with the device, and you can even select a range of time as we, do, as we did with the network and the CPU and you and the memory will be dumped, and you can analyze the current memory of that time, and in that way you can verify that if you are 
and you are storing a lot of objects that don't make any sense, you are having a memory leak in where, that, where those objects are being stored. So I recommend you to, to check it as well. And then I, uh, I'm going to, to review some developer tools that you have on, already on the device and are way important as well. And this is similar to the CPU profiler, but in the device. And what allows you is to analyze the GPU and check which operations and how many time are taking. And you can do it from the developer tools, enable, enabling this, this, this flag. And this graph is, is going to be shown into the device and represents the amount of time that is taking for, for rendering on the different commands on the GPU. For example, if you see the, the video, you will check that there is a lot of red when I'm going through the recycler view. And that's probably because as we are showing images there, we are sending too much OpenGL to the commands, which is normal. It's not bad. But the point here is that we are not bypassing that green line, which represents, again, the 60 frames per second goal. Because if we go higher that than line, means that we are going to lose frames, and that's not good. That will show your application laggy, and the, ex the experience it won't be good enough. So you can check it. The different colors are all explained into the developer docs. You have the greens are for animation, measure layout, input handling, and you can then verify everything there. So I recommend you to check it. Two more uh, developer options that I use quite a lot is the show layout bounds, because I actually work a lot with on UI and allows me to verify if I'm, ha I'm having some problems why, why I'm having them. And the next one is the destroy activities flag. And this is a very good one, because it represents a device that, have, that has no memory enough to say to recover the state of your application when you send the application to background. And actually, the, the video is not working, and I don't know why. Anyway, uh, this means that when okay, you open the, the application, you send the application to background, and you recover it. And if you have this flag turned on, the system will recreate the activity that you send to background. And as well, when you resume an activity, it won't be stored because you are not keeping the activities, and it will be recreated. And you probably want to verify how, how your application is, be, is behaving in those scenarios because are pretty common on devices that are not fully, fully performant as the mind that I have a Pixel 3. Uh, another very good tool that you can use when working with UI mostly is the overdraw viewer. And actually, here we are the bad ones. We are the improvable, and the good one is Twitter. And it allows you to visually verify or check how many times your UI is being drawn. And the more times that your UI is being, is being drawn means that the more time the system will take to show the image, the, the activity, or your view to the user. And there are different colors. No color is, is the best scenario, as we can check with Twitter at the right. And at the left, there is green, because I think that I'm setting a color on background or something like that. I, I, I'm not using the window, the window background. And it will draw the whole background one time. And that's bad. So if you turn on this tool, you can easily uh, start fixing these kind of issues that are good to, to solve. And then one more tool that I, I like to recall, and as you can see, all these tools are not new, are not life changer, are just tools that you already have when you install Android Studio. And this one is included into the emulator, OK? And is the emulator snapshots. You are, you are using them already, because when you turn on a device, you probably notice that if you you said that device previously, or the emulator, I'm referring device as an emulator, it will save the state when closing, and it will be recovered when, when resuming that device. And that internally is doing a snapshot, is storing it, 
and then is recovering. So you can use the snapshots to create your own ones in specific scenarios of your application, seeing that you have a hard scenario to reproduce. For example, a database migration. Let's say that you have a version six of a database and you want to test or to check how your application is behaving when you, is, when you install a version with the database eight, how your code migrates regarding database. So if you, if you are doing this manually, that's, that means that you have to pick the right APK. You have to install it into the device. And then you have to, to run your version and verify. And if you do something wrong, you have to go back the whole process, and that's a time, a time taking. So the snapshot is a, a very good tool to use. I recommend you to check it as well. And an interesting fact is, is that you can load a snapshot via command line. And think about a testing pipeline where you have an emulator, and within a snapshot, you will have a very known state that where your application is without doing any work. So I recommend you to check it as well at, and, and to start using it. And then is the screen record, which, okay. The, the point here is that I discovered that uh, it allows you to output a GIF, which is very good because it allows you to pick that GIF and drag it to, the, to a pull request, and you don't have to reference an ugly link or something like that because it, have, it doesn't allow us to submit videos. So it's something good to know. And then is the layout inspector that I use. I use it very frequently. And it allows you to inspect the whole UI that you have because you probably know that the deeper UI you have, the less performant that your application will have as well. And this is a very nice tool to verify also the values of the different parameters within every view inside your layout hierarchy. So it's a very good one. I normally open it via command plus A, which is the fine action shortcut in Android Studio. And I type like layout inspector, which is the name of the tool, and that's it. As soon as you have your application running. And in fact, the, the, this view, it, it will be saved, saved, and that means that you can recover it later. So you don't have to, to, to need the emulator to turn it, up, turn it on all the times. And then I'm going to share some IntelliJ plugins, just a few ones, because I don't think that there are too, too, too many interesting. And one that I usually use is the IDB idea, which allows you within the, the IDE to install, to uninstall, to clear the data and the, pack the package of an application, revoke the permission, start, start the app with the debugger attached, which can be interesting. And it's really easy to install. You only have to go to browse repositories inside the IDE and then look for ADB idea, and that's it. And actually, I'm missing the, the Nyan cut because I went for other. OK, yes, because it is it, in, in other category. The next category that I'm going to share are passive tools. These tools in the opposite of the previous category. That, that's my dog, again. Okay, and that's the application that you don't need to have the, the, the emulator the or the device plug it to your, to your computer for using them. And one is the presentation assistant. I use this one a lot because on, on the Android team we do pair programming two times per week, more or less, and it's really useful in case that you are telling something to, to your pair and he asked you about what did you type, and you only have to, to reply, okay, I, you only need to look at the bottom and that's it, shut up. And it's also very useful if you do, if you do something with the IDE live in your company, a meetup or something like that, you can show up how you are using the IDE and probably someone will know something new, which is interesting. Is called Presentation Assistant and is again under the, the plugin repository of JetBrains. And then is the Nyan Cat. I use it a lot as well and I love it because you probably know as an Android, as an Android developer, if you are, that Gradle builds take time. So it, it brings you a bit of joy. So I recommend you to check it as well. Um, it's again an, under the, the, the repositories of JetBrains. And one more tool is the toolbox that allows you to 
uh, manage the different versions of JetBrains software that you might have installed in, in your computer. It allows you to list the projects as well. And uh, it has a Chrome extension that if you install it on GitHub, you can only click on that Intel G button and it will be open into, into your ID, which is a bit interesting. And it allows you to set some minor settings as well as the max memory that, you, that the ID might have and install the command line tools and some minor things more. And then it's Postman. We use Postman a lot. Uh, Postman is shared acra across the, the teams and it's really useful because you can add automation scripts, you can run tests, run test for backend, you might have multiple environments. For example, we have three, which are development, uh, production, and staging. And it's really, really good for documentation as well. So if you are a small team and you can, and you need to track your API and you didn't know this tool because it's really, really popular as well, I recommend you to check it. And then, as an Android developer, I'm not doing too much command line. Actually, I do very, very few. And uh, my setup is really easy. I have all my set as H as the shell, the auto suggestions plugin that this one is very interesting because it suggests you commands that you are typing based on the, of, on the history of commands that you already typed in the past. And for me, sometimes I feel that I'm a bit stupid because I'm running always the same commands. I don't know if you do that. And this saved me a lot of time. And I use item two as the application for the terminal. And then I use a tool as well, which is called AutoJump, which allows me to within typing G and the folder that, that I want to visit without typing the whole tab, it will move me to, to that directory. And is doing it under the hood, um, storing the frequency of places that you visit uh, when traversing the, your folder through terminal, and I recommend you to check it as well. It's called AutoJump, and it's really easy to install and to, add and to configure as well. And then let's going to talk, there is Thaira at the bottom as well. That's one, one Sunday walking through, through the forest. Okay, uh, this, par this part of the talk is for troubleshooting. I mean, with troubleshooting, when we have a bug, how we do for discovering it, and what we can do for improving that experience on finding quickly something that is not going well. Uh, we use Remote Lab, the Firebase Remote Lab, Remote Lab from time to time for run our integration test, and <laughs> you have to put the pocket because it's a bit expensive, but as, as you use it and run your tests from time to time, you, it, it provides you a nice output of, of what went wrong. You can select the, the matrix of devices and configurations directly from Android Studio, and the output of the test regarding the test result, if, it, if it's good or not, it will be shown right on the IDE as well. And it will provide you a full video with all your tests, a video per test only showing the, the right part of the video, a stack trace is something is not going well, logs, and more things. So it's a very nice tool. And if you have integration test, I recommend you to check it as well. And then, of course, Crasslytics is, is the king here. Previously, um, Crasslytics was Fabric. Um, before Fabric, Fabric was Crasslytics. And I actually love it where, when Qualytics was under Twitter because currently, for me, it's missing too many features. But you can, if you do it properly, you can get nice, nice insights from, from your users. For example, what if you log, because you can log when with Qualytics as the user is using the application, the life cycle events of the activities and fragments. That means that you will be able to easily reproduce the path that that user made, and you will have that output on the crash report. So you can probably reproduce that issue. You can do it as well with the analytics events, because usually it represents key points of the application as well. So thanks to this, 
maybe you are going to be faster when finding a, a, an issue. And another thing that we actually do is when we have an interceptor for OK HTTP that probably you know it because it's maybe the, the, the way where the 90% of developers are using network on Android. Uh, we log when something is not going good on backend. And in that way, we can check also what is going on on the report. And as we are doing a lot of background jobs, we log also when the, log, when the job starts, the parameters that are sent, and the result of them. And in that way, we can check what's going on with that user on, right on the crash report. More things that we do with Crashlytics is that we, you can set the user ID in case that you, if something is not going well, you can check it on, on backend as well and try to get more insight about the issue that, that, are happen, that is happening with that user. And then we, and also we, we store some report keys. One is the activity that the application was shown when the crash happened. And this is interesting to do. You can do it attaching an observer of the life, ci of the life cycle, or I cannot remember too much because it has been added so, so much ago. But we represent the activity that, have, that has crashed when the, when the report happened, and that means that we know uh, where, where is happening, the, the issue. We are uh, sending the heap state, the memory, and some more things. We actually could add more keys, and we should. And this is a, a nice way to have some feedback as well from your, from your application. And another funny thing and fancy tool, and it's pretty useful, useful because I, I found sometimes a pr pretty hard bugs thanks to this, is that Samsung provides you a remote test lab and allows you to, in a dark way, run Samsung devices that are physical devices. Uh, and there, you can submit your, your APK and test how your APK is behaving in Samsung devices, because probably you as an Android developer love Samsung too much, and the nice ways of that they have to, to reproduce very weird, very weird bugs. So it allows you to, to, to do this. We actually had a funny situation on Popsy that was that a user was complaining that on the chat screen, the, the message box was missing, and what's, re and what's really weird for us, because let me check if I go to the conversation screen and I can show it. Yes, that box. Actually, I discovered thanks to this tool that on Samsung you can hide the navigation bar. And that was crazy for me because the issue was on the route that the activity flags were wrong set, but that issue only appeared on Samsung as soon as they didn't have physical button. So we discovered, uh, thanks to this tool, you have some credits to, to, to spend here, and you can, you can use and test your application. And I found something really, really funny when preparing the conversation and, and taking the demo, and is that people is, is messy too much with this, and there are very huge trolls, because they put you a dialogue that says, please, do, do not screen log, do no factory reset, disable developer option or USB debugging, and installing Fortnite. And, and this is real because people actually is installing Fortnite on these Samsung devices, which it doesn't make any sense. And people are, are bad enough to factory reset a device, which is not good neither. Because it's funny because they, they say that they are, wa they are wa wasting too many time to fix these kind of issues. So I, I imagine the Samsung developers complaining about the users too much. And the next part that I like to share is the part where of how we manage code reviews, how we use Git, and, and the pull request. Let me recall that we are a small team. On the Android developer, we are only two developers, so we are not huge. But we are actually very comfortable working this way, and I think that we are effective. And first, we use detect. We, have, we are pretty ag aggressive on it, since we include it into the Gradle process. This means that if detect doesn't 
pass with an amount of fails of zero. It, this is that if you have one, uh, one issue of the tech, they, they will won't compile. And moreover, bit rise, which is our CI, won't, won't submit the build and it will fail. And it's very good because we are including KTLint in, inside the tech for formatting our, our code base in a consistent manner. And it does some code analysis regarding complexity and too many things that you can configure for your specific code base and it's really, really, really good, good to have. We use Bitrise. We actually love Bitrise because you don't have to set a very complex bash scripts to have things uh, working. They have a market of steps that you can add as, as, as an stupid and put it one after the other. And on Bitrise, we run our unit test, our integration test, because they allow you to add a virtual device testing step that they use Firebase under the hood, I guess, or I think. And it's more or less easy to configure, so I recommend you to check it out. And that means that we are not doing too many regressions because we should do more integration tests that we have, but at least the, the, the core features of the app are integration tested. And in that way, we ensure that some things won't fail as we go forward within the development. And it's good to have as well. And then we do uh, code reviews. We use GitHub a lot. Um, and we enjoy so much doing code reviews because I think that that's the point that you should have when working, is to enjoy, to learn, and to have fun. And we also try to maintain some respect regarding authors, reviewers, and when I should submit a pull request. I only should submit a pull request once I verify that everything is passing, that everything is, is going well, that there are no bugs or stupid bugs that I could have noticed looking at the diff at the time of submitting a, a pull request. I actually, when I submit a pull request, I forget about it. I mean, before, just before submitting it. I forget about it, I wait maybe two hours, I create the pull request, I check the diff, and only after traversing the whole diff, I notice that appears to be good, so press the green, boot, the green button to submit the pull request. And we have some GitHub templates as well to ensure that at least the author writes a right description, it includes how to test the pull request and what the review sort of put special attention on, on, on it. And we as, as a reviewers as well, we are used to comment th things that doesn't work good, okay, or fails in the, in the pull request. I think that it's really, really important to give feedback as well when things are very well done or when you learn something thanks to the author of the pull request. And in that way, we try to, to encourage that. We use a lot of GIFs, which is fun and, and enjoys when reading. Um, the goal is to provide value and learn during the process. And then we, some, we have some minor automations when running a pull, a pull request. And for that, we made a very stupid app with the, the ProBot, I, I think it's a framework, a library, or something like that, that allows you to receive the hooks the, the web hoops once a pull request is created, and it gives you the div, it gives you the pull request name, and in that way you can do some minor checks and accept or throw the pull request, which is really, really good because in that way we ensure that the title is always following our pattern, that there is always one as in need, that a specific set of tags are set to the pull request. For example, the priority, which we represent the priority that a reviewer should have when deciding to put time on the pull request. This is high, this pull request means to, to be fixed really soon, or low, this pull request can wait unless I do some important personal task. I don't know. And then we also validate that the description, the description must include a fixed fixes or closes uh, previously with a hashtag in order to fix or close always one issue that we had. And if not, the, the pull request won't pass. And in that way, we can, we can maintain some consistency 
and we don't have to, to be saying the same things every time. Uh, we also share some labels because we have different projects under the organization, and in order to keep some consistency, um, we share the labels. There is a repository that allows you to do that, and to install them and to submit them into every pull request in, in every in every repository. And we use some priority tags regarding what I said before, the status. For example, in the, if this pull request is stuck, is this pull request waiting for, for mockups from the designer? Is this pull request waiting for translations to the translator to, to put them? And the type, which is which is a feature, a book, a refactory, an enchantment, or and some minor things more. And another thing that is interesting to do regarding GitHub is that you can very easily reference code from the IDE. And this is that if you have GitHub well configured in your IDE, you can use the open on GitHub, open on GitHub feature, and it will open GitHub on, on your browser, and you can pick a link and reference into a pull request in a very easy manner. And it allows you as well to, to create pull requests and to create git, uh, gist, gist, gist. We use our git flow, because I don't know which git flow is, because probably some, someone will complain about this is not git flow or whatever. We use feature branches. This is that we have two main branches, which are develop and master. And we create feature branches from develop. These feature branches merge to develop. And we, we create a release branch when having to do a release from develop as well and merge to master. And when we do hot fixes, we branch from master directly. That's how we work, and it works well for us. And another interesting tool that I have, or that I use, is Git Town, that allows you to automate some minor things when using Git Flow, or well, this Git Flow. For example, if I'm in a feature and someone has merged something before on develop, if I do Git Town sync, it will go to develop fetch pull, then will merge to develop with my branch, and then will submit my branch. So it's a very good thing to automate stuff. And if things go crazy, that usually go crazy, I use fork when I have to cherry pick too much comment, to rebase interactively, and to delete a huge amount of branches or something like that. I use fork, and we use fork, and it works good for me. And that's all I have. If you have any question, I don't know if we have enough time to answer them. If you are not very comfortable asking here live, you have my Twitter handle. And um, thank you for, for your attention.